Amityville story is one that has fascinated people for decades because it's got true crime elements, it's got a massive paranormal following, and it's also been the subject of a lot of debate over the years as to whether the events experienced by the Lutz family legitimately happened or was it part of some elaborate money-making scheme. So let's take a look at what happened and then you can decide for yourselves. Today, police combed the DeFeo's handsome three-story house for clues while divers explored the backyard swimming pool for the still unfound murder weapon. The real-life horror story began on November 13, 1974, when a 23-year-old man named Ronald DeFeo Jr. fatally shot his parents and his four younger siblings while they were asleep in their home in Amityville, New York. Hours after murdering them, DeFeo went to a nearby bar crying for help. DeFeo initially claimed to the police that the murders had likely been a mob hit and his act was apparently so convincing that he was taken to a local station for protection. But it didn't take long for cracks to form in his story and by the next day he had already confessed to killing his family himself. People we talked to seemed to feel that whatever was the motive for this crime, it had something to do with the family. It's not something that's going to return to bother anyone else. Now, the proverbial paranormal shit hit the fan at 112 Ocean Avenue when the Lutz family moved in. In December 1975, George and Kathleen Lutz bought the house for what was considered to be a bargain price of $80,000. Kathy had three children from a previous marriage, Daniel, Christopher, and Melissa, who was also known as Missy. And basically the whole family left or fled 28 days later because of all the paranormal happenings and experiences which they had in the house. Now, William Weber, who was DeFeo's attorney, said that he was offered a cash advance by a publisher for a book regarding the DeFeo murders. DeFeo's case wasn't going well at this stage and Weber then tried to get some type of insanity plea for Ronnie DeFeo. And um, Ronnie was, you know, he, they then came up with the whole thing of he heard voices or he was possessed and um, Weber tried to include the Lutzes because it would strengthen his case if the current inhabitants of the house would also claim that there were paranormal happenings you know, going on there. The Lutzes, however, cut a deal with Prentiss Hall and Jay Anson, and they actually cut Weber out of the deal. Weber still tried to carry on as he enlisted the help of a freelance writer, and he eventually published an account of the Lutzes' experiences in the house. The Lutzes then subsequently sued him for an invasion of privacy, which was settled in 1979. Weber eventually confessed and said that the whole thing was a hoax and that it was made up over a few bottles of wine as he discussed the case with them while showing them crime scene photos. The house has never been haunted. It isn't haunted today. For example, the black and green fingerprints depicted in the crime scene photos would become the black slime in Jay Anson's book while Jody, the demon pig, was actually the neighbor's cat that always used to come onto the DeFeo's property. And Ronnie DeFeo always used to refer to the cat as a fat pig. Apart from this, there seems to be numerous instances that pretty much decreases the credibility of the Lutzes and what was written in Jay Anson's book, for example. According to Anson's book, the time of death for the DeFeo murders was at around 3.15 a.m., but according to the coroner, he has never spoken to Anson and he has only ever given a time frame that ranged between 12 and 24 hours. Stephen Kaplan, a self-styled vampirologist and ghost hunter, was also called to investigate the house and his relationship with George Lutz soured considerably after he stated that he would expose any fraud that was found. And um, after that, the Lutzes didn't want to work with him anymore. And subsequently, he published a book in 1995 called The Amityville Horror Conspiracy. The Lutzes have also claimed that they found some type of demonic hoof print in the snow. However, weather records have shown that there was no snowfall during this time period in Amityville. According to the book, the Lutz has also stated that they contacted the police numerous times to come to the house while they were experiencing these strange occurrences during the 28 days. However, police records have shown that they were not contacted once and that they never went to the house. George Lutz also supposedly consulted with the Amityville Historical Society, who told him that the 
house was built on a spot where the Shinnecock Indians used to corral their sick and dying and that the place was infested with demons. However, a curator at the Amityville Historical Society has since stated that the Shinnecock Indians never lived anywhere near Amityville. Strangely enough, George Lutz has stated that he never wanted any publicity from his experiences at the Amityville house, but he owns 94% of a company called Amityville Horror Enterprises LLC, which has a hand in a lot of books as well as sequels that have been made about the Amityville Horror. He's also gone on to give speeches about his experiences in the house. There's a storm outside which only we can hear in the house. As well as appearing on numerous television shows. Called the Amityville Horror, and there is now a movie out, or about to come out, of the book. George and Kathleen Lutz are with us this morning to talk about what happened during those 28 days in Amityville. And... After leaving the house, George Lutz was also quoted as saying the following with regards to his family. We now appreciate good things more. We are closer together. We value materialistic things less. Privacy is not just about where we live, but about our thoughts. They are no one else's business. So it's no one else's business, yet he brings out a book with Jay Anson. And as far as their family relationship goes, he ended up suing Christopher Lutz, who now goes by Christopher Quarantino, in a Nevada district court for copyright infringement and fraud pertaining to a future Amityville movie which was planned by George Lutz. Quarantino attributes much of the Amityville hype over the years to his adopted father. He claims Lutz exaggerated stories of the house being haunted to help write the book. Now, as my understanding, Missy Lutz has never publicly spoken about the experiences that herself and her family had in the Amityville house. But now this brings us to Daniel Lutz, who was featured in a 2012 documentary called My Amityville Horror. And he says something along the lines of, that the story's been following him around for his entire life and that he can't hide from it anymore. I didn't want to be the Amityville horror kid. I've been running away from it and it finally caught up to me. Except Jewel Martin, who was the main journalist covering the whole Amityville story during that time, said that he was approached by Daniel Lux during the late 1980s about trying to sell him the true story of what happened in the Amityville house and that the story that was out there was supposedly some sort of fabrication. Martin says that he refused to pay him for the story and never heard from Daniel Lutz again. He also apparently approached Steve Kaplan with regards to selling him the story and like Jewel Martin, Kaplan refused to pay for a story and never heard from him again. Now, with regards to this documentary, Daniel Lutz was also the one to reach out to Eric Walters, who made the documentary and who also owns a website called theamityfiles.com. And I'm not saying I don't believe everything. I'm just, I don't. I believe that he believes what he's saying. Um, and that's, I can leave it, that's, that's all I can say. Lutz has always stated that he never wanted to do the documentary for a quick buck. And when Eric Walter asked him, in the documentary whether he would do a polygraph test he got very combative which to me along with trying to sell the story decades before just decreases his credibility it should be noted that george and kathy lutz actually did undergo a polygraph test and they did pass but now on the other hand you know these things are inadmissible in court so how much does it really count now with regards to other paranormal aspects there was also the famous ghost boy photograph well, that was taken by uh, another investigator while investigating the house along with Ed and Lorraine Warren, who actually took part in a televised seance at the house. You know, more publicity. But it has also been said that the image in the photograph is actually that of another investigator, Paul Bartz, and that the effect of the eyes is actually as a result of infrared from the film. It should be noted that John and Catherine Monaghan were the original owners of the house. I think they built the house and they lived there happily for many years, as well as some of the owners who have owned the house after the Lutzes have also, you know, 
had no paranormal experiences and they have also stated that they believe that the whole thing was a hoax. This house is not haunted, it never was haunted. It was a money-making fraud. In conclusion, I think people need to decide for themselves whether they believe that the haunting experience by the Lutzes, you know, is really legitimate or that it was some money-making scam by uh, an opportunist that was George Lutz. Um, I'm inclined to kind of call bullshit on the whole thing. But it could also be that the Lutzes did experience something, but that it got greatly exaggerated to, you know, possibly increase book sales or get movie deals or whatever the case may be. The Lutzes, they have my congratulations. They made a very successful commercial venture and they pulled the wool over the public's eyes. Whatever your stance is on this, whether you think it's, it's legitimate or it was all a big hoax, this story will continue to fascinate people for decades to come.